Well, Jim, you know, the last time we talked, we got honey off of our hives and into the place where they're going to be extracted. And that's when I, I, I got some ideas I want to bounce off you, and I know you've got some. So let's talk about extracting today. I'll, I'll look forward to that. You know, Kim, extracting is not beekeeping. It's a different world. So I'll look forward to talking about something besides bees for a while. Hi, I'm Kim Flottam. And I'm Jim Tew. And today we're going to talk about random thoughts on extracting here on Honey Bee Obscura. It'll be all over the page, Kim, so we've got to narrow it down, son. You are listening to Honey Bee Obscura. Brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, hosts Kim Flottam and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world. Get ready for an engaging discussion to delight and inform all beekeepers. If you're a long timer or just starting out, Sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. Honey extracting is a lot like so many other things in beekeeping, like hive stands. You know, the way your extracting operation is set up is probably unique to you. Where you put it, how you put it, why you put it. All those things kind of make up the way you process your honey. There is no exact precise way to do it you know one thing right at the beginning you got to keep in mind here's the deal honey's a food and you got to keep it clean if you in your process don't keep it clean you're going to have trouble down the road just keep this in mind would you feed your extracted honey to your family and if you're good with that then you're probably good all the way down the line but just keep in mind it's a food kim that's an excellent point that is just superb that and always neatness and cleanliness counts. And while we're being open and honest here, it's going to be a real struggle to stay that way. Honey is notoriously <laughs> sticky and clings, and there's cappings that stick to the floor, and there's household foment and concern about the mess that's being made. You know, our friend Ann Harmon once said about extracting, because she at least for a while, extracted in her kitchen. And she said, did you know that one pound of jar can completely cover every surface inside your kitchen? <laughs> Floors, ceilings, walls, tables, stove, pots and pans, sinks, every, and, and you'll have some left. So it's, wherever you're going to be, know that it's going to probably be somewhat sticky. So have water and rags and what have you available all of the time and make sure they're clean when you start and get rid of them when you're done. Yep. And I want to add this right now. You cannot beat hot water. So if there's any possible way when you're thinking about where you're going to extract, small-scale extraction, certainly large-scale extraction, is hot water. It'll cut that honey. It softens that wax. It will make your life so much easier. It's a simple test. Take a honey extractor and try to clean it with cold water, or take a honey <laughs> extractor and try to clean it with hot water, and see which of those processes makes you feel better. So, yeah. on the basic list of things, if you possibly can, have hot water and plenty of it. Well, you know, I don't extract my honey. I take it over and Buzz and I extract it using his equipment. No matter the scale of your operation, whether you've got two colonies and you're going to have two supers of honey to extract, or you've got 200 colonies and you're going to have a lot more to extract, here's the thing to put at the top of your list. Wheels. Don't lift any more than you absolutely have to muscle it. Put it on wheels and move it around. Now I'll tell you what Buzz has got. He gets his he gets his load of supers when he or my load of supers, and he backs right up to his garage door in his, in his honey house, and he can drop those supers off from the back of that truck onto, and it's it's called a roller, and they use them in factories a lot. Think of it as a ladder laying on flat, supported by you know off the floor about three or four feet. And 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 it, instead of steps on a ladder, it's got wheels. 
And you just drop that box on there and you slide it right over to the uncapping machine. And the only lifting you have to do is to drop it off the back of the truck. Oh, it's like a conveyor. Yeah, kind of, but it, but it's muscle-made. It isn't, it isn't automated. Right. It's, it's the way we used to unload paint at my dad's paint business. And it's probably the way you unloaded yes. groceries where the semi-rig pulled in, laid that conveyor out, and then rolled that stuff down. What great fun that was to ride those cases of paint down the conveyor. <laughs> well, I, I I got it for Buzz because they, they got a they had it at the, the root candle factory when I first started there. And they mechanized, and they got a conveyor that had a motor on it, and they didn't want this one that didn't have a motor. So they said, anybody want it? And I raised my hand faster than right. anybody else, and I took it home. Good man. Good man. I knew exactly what to use it for. <laughs> All right. I like it. Everything should have wheels on it. Yep. Anything possible. And, you know, they can be small wheels. They can be casters. Or it can be a hand truck. In the bee house. A hand truck with hard rubber tires is fine, but in the B yard, I want a hand truck with pneumatic tires. They kind of have some yeah. some roll to it. So put yep. put wheels on on everything. And let me let me add this because I you we're not you and I both have experience with this. The way you feel when you start is not at all the way you're going to feel later in the day or even the next day. So if you think you can get by without them because you're just starting out and you feel good, the radio is going, the honey is flowing, everything is good, you're going to be completely worn out by the end of the afternoon. So think later in the day. Don't think earlier in the day. Exactly. What Buzz doesn't do and what a lot of, but what a lot of people do, Buzz takes his supers off in the field and he extracts them that day. And and if you can't do that, and a lot of people can't, I you know I've only got I go I go out and get them after supper, and they're going to sit there until supper after supper tomorrow night. In between, they got to stay warm. Warm honey, warm yep. honey comes out of the cells a lot a lot faster and a lot easier than cold cool or cold honey. You remember our friend Bob Smith? Oh yeah, I do. Bob had a, a, a very unique layout for a very small hobby beekeeper. He had he had a, a, a bathroom, an extra bathroom, and you could get to it. It was in his basement, and he, he, he rigged up a device that he could slide his supers down the basement stairs from outside on a ramp using pulleys. And so there was no muscles involved. And when they got down there, they landed on a tray with wheels that he could just wheel into this bathroom. And what this bathroom has is about six feet by 12 feet. One end of it was a shower. And he would put his supers in that shower. That was lifting. And he would get six or seven in there. And he put a small heater in there and then when he and let it run on a timer for eight or 10 hours. And when he was, re when he was ready, then that those honey supers would be just nice and warm. He could he closed it in with a, just something as simple as a shower curtain, opened them up, and then he had to lift them again up to his uncapping table. That's the last time he lifted them, but he had to lift it from the stack in the in the heating room up onto that onto that table. But then he could he could uncap and he could uh, leave the frames laying right on his capper, move around his capper, take them off and put them in the extractor or in his frame holder. And he didn't do any more lifting. And that's kind of the goal. I think, you know, what you were just talking about is being at the end of the day, the less lifting you do, the better you're going to feel tonight at eight o'clock. Yep. Well, I got about five things I want to add to what you just said, but let me take a short break here from our commercial sponsor, and I'll come back and ask you some questions here. Hey, podcast listeners, here's what we've been waiting for all year long. It's time to harvest and extract the honey. When you're ready to bottle and sell your crop, head over to betterbee.com. There you can shop for custom honey labels and glass or plastic honey containers. As your partners in Better Beekeeping, Better Bee does all the work of figuring out the weight each honey container will hold, not just the standard water weight or volume measure. 
so you can choose from the classics or go bold and different with a great selection of uniquely designed bottles. Check out our 50-plus container options and order with confidence at BetterBee.com. You know, Kevin, when you said he heats the honey, I, I want to tell the people who've not done this a lot that, yes, that you really want to extract warm honey. It flows so much easier. But you, you, you have to spend some hours doing that. If you've got a stack of honey, you can't just put a heater beside it and come back 30 or 40 minutes later and because the side of the hive is, uh, the side of the super is warm, think you're good to go. No, it's, it's got to sit there enough so that when you walk in that room, you get hit with heat and humidity. It's warm in that room. Honey is hard to warm, but it needs to be warm to extract it. I, I admire our old friend Bob for doing that. Secondly, I was going to say, you know, that Bob's using what he had. He had that bathroom. I would, could not extract in my bathroom without having a discussion with the other people who live in my house. So I don't have a bath. I'm, I'm one to improvise something else. So Bob did a good job making work what he had. And for those of us who don't have that, you got to figure out some way to go. You got to figure out what you do have. Or what you could have on a temporary basis. Yep. And a lot of people I know that, that do this that don't have that bathroom, they've got a setup that they put up an extraction season and they take it down when it's over and they put it away and it folds up and stands next to the wall and sits there until next year. So that may be something you want to think about, some kind of folding, you know, a, a, an enclosed area that you can use for heating uh just canvas and poles maybe all yep. it is with the you know with an umbrella on top it doesn't have to be huge and it doesn't have to be leak proof or air nope. you know airtight or anything it does not but if you yeah, if you can enclose an area put a heater in it uh you one thing you got to watch for of course is fire you know is that heater safe is that you know everything far enough away so that it isn't going when it gets hot it's not going to touch so keep that in mind too and have drip boards under the stack, because if you are successful in heating the honey and you do make it flow better, it's going to flow right out of those supers, you know, the, the from burr combs and whatever, right down to the floor. So have drip boards or pans sitting on those casters that you're rolling it around on. A cover works. An old cover that you got works. It's metal, oh, so yeah. it's not going to leak. Yep. One of the other things you, you got to think about, or actually two other things. One is if you're like Buzz or Bob, you probably don't bring any bees home, but almost all the rest of us bring some bees home. Yep. What are those bees going to do? Where are they going to go? Well, at Buzz's, some, I say Buzz doesn't bring any bees home. He brings hardly any bees home, but he brings some home once in a while. And most people do. If you're, if, you're, if you're thinking about this before you build it, you want to have a place where those bees can go when... They're in the hot room. They, they can they can fly out. Maybe there's an entrance in the you know a, 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 an opening in the in the ceiling if you've got one, and they can go up to a window or up to a light or up to a bee escape in the wall, some place that they can go to out of the warming room, and some place that you're not going to grab a, a hold of and move and get a handful of bees. And if you can get them out of the building, so much the better. Great, great, and great. And as usual, while you're talking, I'm thinking, because I've been in these rooms before, if perchance you can't get them out, then could you possibly have a room with a high ceiling? Can you at least get them away from you? Because I've had some miserable work in an extracting room with a low ceiling and fluorescent tubes, and the bees were just a foot and a half above my head, so they were constantly dropping down on me. They weren't trying to cause confusion. They were just tiring and confused. So in a perfect world, Kim, if, if you can't get rid of the bees, can you at least raise the ceiling so you can get them away from you? Do something but to keep those few bees. And you know, it won't, it'll only be a few hundred, but you go ahead, about 10, 15 stings later, it's going to seem like there's thousands of bees in that room. So keep things on yep. wheels, try to get the bees out that you brought in, and have hot water. What's next? Once you got them warmed and you've taken care of that, then they're still on wheels, on a two-wheeler or on that cart or how, however you got on wheels. Then you get them from that hot room to your on-capping location. And some people have, you know, you can lay out an on-capping situation. One way to do it is to, 
to uh, uh, put your stack of supers right next to your uncapper. And it depends on what kind of uncapper you got too. Yep. Um, if you've got if you've got a flail on capper, you can take them right out of your right out of your super and put them in the flail on capper. If you've got a if you if you don't have that and you're doing it by hand, then you've got to have some sort of container that you can stand the the, the frame on inside that container. And there's a lot of these on the market. You stand the frame uh, inside the container on a resting rod. And you're doing this by hand, probably with a fork or maybe a, a knife, electric knife, whatever it is you're uncapping with. The cappings fall, and they're caught on a screen, and the honey drips through the screen, and you capture that honey later, and the wax stays on top of the screen, and you scrape it off into your wax collection area. Figure that one out, because if you can make that as neat as possible, you're going to be glad you did because it's the messiest part of what you're going to be doing. Yep. So you're basically, if I'm following you, you're describing what I would call an uncapping tank with a strainer on it, right or wrong. Right. One of the jobs I had in mind, when you uncap by hand, you start out, you know, you're whistling, you're singing, your hands are clean, your apron's dry. <laughs> and by by the time eight or 12 or 15 supers have passed, you can't believe how your hands are cramping. If you stick that hot knife to your hand one more time, you don't have any words left to add to the situation there. So I'm, it seems like I'm just a very pessimistic person. No, I'm not. I'm not. You know, we talked in one of the uh, former episodes about taking honey off. That's work. Well, taking honey out of the comb is work, too. So just be ready. I mean, it's it's rewarding work, but this this is this is meaningful work, Kim. It is one of the things that before you ever start this process, look at how how the frames are going to flow through the the system you're putting together. So once I got them uncapped and I got honey dripping off that frame, what am I going to do with that frame? And and if you're building this or imagining this one way, you can take it right off the uncapping pan that you just mentioned and put it right in your extractor that way it'll drip and it'll drip right into your extractor and you can you know open your extractor later and ca capture it along with the rest of the honey that's in there two things happen here you might not be able to have be able to do that if you can't take it right off from, uh, on capping area and put it into your extractor you got to put it someplace you got to let it set someplace and the whole time it's sitting there it's going to leak so have a have a tank that you can hang your frame in, or a table that uh, you know a surface that's slanted so that the honey that you capture runs down and is collected in a you know th it runs out a hole in your table and is collected below. Have something so that you're not swimming in four inches of honey by the end of the day on that table. Years ago, Mexant manufactured a gadget called a merry-go-round. I had one in my lab, and it looked like a merry-go-round with racks on it. And as you uncapped, exactly what you said happened. You put the frames on that merry-go-round in compartments where they dripped and drained through a center hole, and then you'd spin the merry-go-round like one of those racks at a fast food order where the guy flips it around to see what the next order is. The guy on the other side would flip it around and take the uncapped frame off. I don't think those things are manufactured anymore. But... You are so right. So uh, while the extractor is running, if you are in the, oh, heavenly position of having a motorized extractor, while it's <laughs> running and you're uncapping, what are you going to do with those frames you've uncapped? Exactly. Yep. Now, if you don't have a motorized extractor, no problem, because you can't do two things at once. Kim, a good friend of mine, Charlie Pardon, I'm going to give his name. It's got a beautiful honey house. And he does not put down newspaper. He puts down construction paper that you buy at construction stores, you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, that heavy paper. And his floor stays immaculate. When it's over, he rolls it up, throws it away. If you fall for the inclination to put down newspaper, that's going to be horrible. It's going to stick to your feet. That's not going to work. Don't try newspaper. Use Charlie's idea of trying good old-fashioned 
construction paper. I never thought of that. That's a good idea. I hadn't either. Now, you got to be on your hands and knees. I thought when he said I, I taped that to the floor, I thought, well, that'll take me a couple of days getting up and down off the floor. But once <laughs> it's down, his floor is beautiful. I mean, my floor always has, you know, wax and propolis stuck to it after I extract. It requires scraping up. Well, you bring up a good point there, if you can. You're doing this in a place that's got a floor drain. Uh, my garage doesn't have a floor drain. Buzz's honey house does have a floor drain. And when he's down, he hooks up his hose, turns on the hot water, and he just washes everything down, goes to the floor, runs down the drain. Now there's a problem with that, is that every couple of years, he's got to go where that drain goes and clean out the wax that hardened in there. But making cleaning that area where he extracts is real simple because hot water and a floor drain. Yep. And again, I'm agreeing with you. We've got, I know we got to stop. Our time is up. But on that floor drain business, you need a big drain. I mean, you need something that you can get cleaning equipment down there to get that wax out because that wax is durable. It's waterproof. So just because you run it down the drain doesn't mean it goes away that just goes down the drain a few feet and hardens so if i've got a two yep. inch if i've got a two inch drain i'm trying to cobble up it should have been a six inch drain so that i can get proper tools and augers down there to clean that up about like you said once a year or so yeah my my frames are uncapped and i've got them into my extractor and my extractor's running and or I'm running it probably. I'm standing there spinning this spinning this thing, and it takes a while. The warmer your honey is, the less time it's going to take to spin. Whether you got it on a motor or whether you're the the power behind it. So the way Buzz has got his set up, he's got a he's got a electric on, or power on capper or a power extractor. The way his works. He's got a gauge on the front of his his extractor, his extractors, so that when the honey keeps stops coming out of the frames, the the level of the honey on the pipe outside of his extractor stops rising. You know, it's just a pipe right. with with it shows how, how much honey is in there, and when it stops, you know that your frames are empty, and you can power down your extractor and start removing your frames. Uh, and, and that works well. If you're doing this by hand, it's going to be, how long does this take normally? Well, I got to do this for about 10 or 12 minutes and they're usually empty or 15 or 20 minutes, whatever it is. And then you got to stop and check. Once you got them empty, then what? Getting them from the extractor, out of the extractor to someplace where they're going to be next. You know, again, we're talking wheels. Yep. Everything's related, Kim, because now what am I going to do? I've got these empty, wet supers on wheels, and they've got to go somewhere. Probably back to the bees and go back on the bees and let them clean up those sticky frames. If I put them in storage like that, of course, they're going to mold up and mildew. So everything's the next thing, isn't it, Kim? You got them off the bees. Now you got the honey out. Now you got these empty, wet frames. Now what? Now what? Now what? You know, you got a couple choices there. You got a good choice and you got a bad choice and you got a worse choice. The good choice, of course, is to put them back. And I know beekeepers who do it this way. They know what hive this box came off of them. And they're going to put that box back on that hive so that the bees that are cleaning, cleaning up are the bees that lived in that box before he removed it from the hive. I've never been that good. I just put them on one of the hives and let them clean it up. And that does two things. One is it gets a gets the honey off that super. And two is they get to use it. And actually, three is now I've got an empty super on top of my hive. So if there's a late flow, like there, I think there's going to be a late uh, goldenrod flow or a long goldenrod flow this year. So that if they bring in honey, they've got some place to put it. The other choice is to stick them outside on your por front porch probably not the best choice you can make because every bee within five miles will be on those supers trying to get in your house, trying to get in your car, trying to get in your hair, trying to get chasing your neighbors in your neighbor's swimming pool, whatever. So when you're done, you got to put them someplace that they're going to get clean and people are going to be safe. Right. I'm glad you put that caveat on there. Putting those things outside is going to cause absolute chaos. And fighting and robbing and crazy bees. So 
If you have to do it, just don't tell anybody about it, I guess. I, I really hope you can think of something else. Well, one of the things that does happen is if your bees are anywhere close or you just put them in a bee yard thinking that your bees are going to clean them up, your bees are going to clean them up, but so are bees from all over the place. And you just mentioned the the, the worst word here is robbing. You're going to get a, a robbing yep. session going in your yep. bee yard and all intents and purposes yep. because that honey isn't going to last very long, but those bees are going to keep coming back. And if the honey isn't in those boxes, they're going to find it in your boxes. Yep. Kim, that's a good subject. And, you know, it didn't really relate to small-scale extracting, but it's part of small-scale extracting. It's part of large-scale extracting. I'm going to give you a heads up. I'm probably going to ask to come back to this discussion on this segment at some future time, because all of this is such an interesting part of the bee world. But it's not beekeeping, but it's honey processing and all that goes with that. Surprises, all the stickiness, all the reward. We haven't talked about, and uh, and uh, I agree. I think we need to come back and talk about this because once you get that honey in your extractor, and you're done extracting, where is it going to go? Yep. What are you going to do with it? And how do you take care of it? And remember that it's a food. And would you feed it to your family after doing all the things that you did to it to get it there? So I think that kind of wraps it up. Well, it wraps it up for now. Can I leave it like that? You had a lot of good information. Uh, I'm kind of ready to go now. It's like a review on how to get get out the extension cords and the hot knives and how to know which circuit I just popped with two hot knives plugged into one circuit. So good information, Cam. I enjoy talking about it. All right. Well, I guess until next time. Until next time. Keep your floor dry, buddy. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Bye-bye.